Part two, chapter seven and eight of the Mysteries of Marseilles by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seven, the cowl does not make the friar. On arriving at Douglas's, Marius was surprised at the religious calm reigning in the large, cold rooms which he knew to be the abode of crime. He could not accustom himself to such hypocrisy and would have liked the very walls to have proclaimed aloud the notary's infamy the quiet activity of the clerks the respectable appearance of the house exasperated him and filled his mind with painful doubts pale and agitated he had seated himself in the ante-room when douglas caught sight of him from his office the door of which was open come in come in he cried you won't be in my way and i'll attend to you in a minute marius walked in and found five or six priests there among them abbe donadei this abbe ever graceful and smiling was cajoling the notary both by word and look he had come to ask for alms you are one of our friends he was saying and we come to you every time the poor boxes of our parishes are empty you do well sir replied douglas rising and taking some gold from a drawer how much do you want he asked the priest well resumed on a day in a soft tone of voice i think that five hundred francs will suffice we are much in need of the assistance of pious and honourable persons here are five hundred francs said douglas interrupting him and he added in a slightly trembling voice pray for me my father then all the priests rose and surrounded the notary thanking him and calling upon heaven to bless him douglas listened to them erect and very pale and marius fancied he could see a slight nervous trembling of his lips and eyelids donna day with easy elegance was inexhaustible in praise and flattering professions the almighty will repay you what you give us he said he is already doing so by making your business prosper and by bestowing on you the peace of mind that is only awarded to the righteous ah sir you are a grand example in this city which is being corrupted by the materialism of the century i would that the whole of our commercial population imitated your simple life and possessed your piety and kindliness of heart one would not then see the horrible spectacle which marseilles is presenting to us douglas seemed uneasy and wearied by the priest's praise he interrupted him a second time and said as he showed him to the door no no i am no saint every one is in need of divine mercy if you think you owe me any thanks be so good as to pray for me the priests made him a final bow and at last withdrew marius seated in a corner of the room had assisted at this scene in silence he felt indignant at the comedy that was being played before his eyes perhaps douglas felt that he was purchasing heaven's forgiveness and paying well for it with the money he had stolen so this godly man this kind-hearted soul who relieved those in distress this christian who devoted so much of his time to the churches was but a hypocrite and a scoundrel and as marius thought thus whilst watching the priests and notary he fancied he was dreaming with his eyes open he had come to overwhelm a forger and he found himself confronted by a charitable man for whom the very church was offering up prayers when the first moment of surprise was over he felt a still more eager desire to do his duty as the notary advanced towards him smiling and with open and extended hand he drew back slowly gazing at him intently then he said suddenly shut the door douglas surprised and as though incapable of resistance went and closed it bolt it resumed marius as harshly as before we have to talk together douglas shot the bolt and came back looking astonished and displeased what is the matter with you my dear friend he asked and as marius influenced perhaps by a last feeling of pity did not answer he continued but after all you're right it's best to be alone when talking business well are you ready i have procured the document that was wanting and now i only require your signature to complete moutet's mortgage on otier's house you know that we are pressed for time i received another letter this morning from my client otier who begs me to send him some money as quickly as possible the notary rose from his table spread out some papers and dipping a pen in the ink offered it to marius saying simply sign marius had not said a word but had quietly watched each of the notary's movements 
instead of taking the pen he looked him straight in the face and said in a calm tone of voice i went yesterday to see the house in the rue de rome i saw the tenants and the former landlord and they all tell me that they do not know m Othier. douglas turned pale and his lips had again that trembling motion marius had already observed he gathered the papers together laid the pen down and reseated himself as he stammered ah you surprise me very much the day before yesterday continued marius i received a visit from m de girousse a rich landed proprietor of lambesque and he assured me that none of his neighbours was named Othier, and that that person certainly did not exist to-day i know that he was not mistaken what am i to think the notary did not answer he was gazing vaguely before him changing colour and shaking feeling himself lost seeking no doubt in his despair a means of explaining matters satisfactorily i then went to the st just district resumed marius pitilessly the property upon which you told me you had taken a mortgage on your client moutet's behalf happens to belong to one of my mother's old friends m giraud who assured me that his property was quite free i ask you again what am i to think and as douglas still remained silent the young man went on in a louder tone of voice well since you refuse to answer i will tell you myself what i believe and what is indeed true your m othier never existed he is a puppet whom you invented in order to accomplish some nefarious scheme more easily in addition to this you never took any mortgage and you put moutet's money into your own pocket to arrive at this fine result you have committed several forgeries and to-day you are quite prepared to commit others in order to procure a further supply of cash for your needs it was as though marius was speaking to an insensible and motionless statue the notary's calm increased the young man's anger i have not to judge your crimes he continued louder still but i have to ask you for an explanation of your unworthy conduct towards myself what you intended light-heartedly to mix me up in your dirty business you would have compromised me while professing to be my friend and knowing my position as a humble worker i have the right have i not to tell you that you are a scoundrel the notary did not wince and just now resumed marius there were priests here blessing you ah uh, you played your part admirably i alone in marseilles know what you are and were i to state in public the enormity of your crime i should very likely be stoned you have so skilfully duped every one who would believe that the notary douglas that man esteemed by all that frugal religious individual is shamelessly working in the dark the ruin of his numerous clients i myself would still doubt if doubt were possible at seeing you seated so calm before me in your humble and pious attitude of a monk at prayer but say something defend yourself if you can douglas had taken up a paper knife and was playing with it as though indifferent to all marius was saying to him what would you have me tell you he replied at last you judge me as a child i've let you have your say perhaps now you'll listen to me without interrupting chapter eight the notary's speculations when marius heard douglas accuse him of judging like a child he was indignant and opened his lips to tell him that he judged as an honest man would this forger thought it childish that he should be reproached with his forgeries and he assumed the attitude of a misunderstood individual as the young man was on the point of protesting the notary interrupted him with a movement of impatience if you're always talking he said you'll always be in the right i let you insult me to your heart's content so allow me to defend myself without interruption i certainly would rather you had not become acquainted with my system but as you have discovered a part of the truth i prefer to tell you all i know you are intelligent and you will understand me better than any other moreover i am worn out i have not been successful in the application of my theory and i know very well that i am a lost man that's why i consent to unbosom myself entirely to you you will see that i never wished for any one's ruin and that it was with good faith that i offered as a friend to put you in the way of earning a little money anyhow you will judge me and i trust that after hearing my explanation you will simply look upon me as an unfortunate speculator please listen to what i have to say marius almost fancied he was dreaming he looked at douglas as one would look at a madman talking reason 
the peaceful tone of the man his want of remorse his self-satisfied manner made him resemble some honest inventor sadly explaining without cause for shame why his invention had not succeeded there's no need to go into details he resumed and let us put aside the otse and mutet matters which are but of slight importance the thing to see and judge is the whole vast and complicated machine that i had succeeded in establishing you are surprised at my complaisance well i tell you again i am a lost man i can speak without fear of compromising myself in fact i experience a sort of pleasure in explaining my invention to you he took up the position before marius of a man who has an interesting story to tell and was still toying with the paper knife first of all he said i recognize with you that i have betrayed my trust and that i am a great criminal if considered as a notary but i have always looked upon myself as a banker a money-dealer in a word please behold in me nothing more than a speculator when i succeeded my former employer the practice was a very small one my first efforts were directed towards making that practice the medium of a vast business connection i was obliged to satisfy all requirements lend to whosoever needed money borrow of those who wanted to invest sell to those who wished to buy purchase of those who desired to sell i was like the bird catchers who make use of decoy birds to call the wild ones i invented some forty imaginary persons in whose names i was able to embark in all kinds of transactions Outi, i admit was one of them i was thus enabled to purchase a large number of buildings which i paid for by means of loans contracted by the fictitious purchasers and by granting mortgages on these buildings by these means i created a capital a considerable turnover a much more extended practice which served as a foundation to my credit douglas was speaking in a clear tone of voice he continued after a short silence you must know that when one speculates on money one is at times brought face to face with terrible exigencies i should have been forced to stop at the very outset of my speculations if my buildings being mortgaged i had not been able to procure by some means the funds necessary for the other operations i was contemplating i did what seemed to be the simplest and most convenient thing to do when the mortgages had reached the full value of the properties i released the latter by false discharges and then offered them as security for fresh loans what you are telling me is infamous exclaimed marius i begged you not to interrupt me douglas retorted abruptly i will defend myself later on at present i am merely stating the facts i soon had to enlarge my system my forty personages no longer sufficed so i then had recourse to extreme measures which from their very audacity succeeded perfectly i caused well-known landowners and merchants to contract loans mortgaged their properties and forged their signatures afterwards each fresh mortgage was wiped out by the aid of a false discharge which shielded me from all uneasiness you understand it's very simple yes yes i understand murmured marius who was beginning to think the notary was mad besides douglas went on i raised money no matter how when it was necessary i wish to go straight to my goal and i have ever marched steadily on without troubling myself about obstacles and accepting freely the consequences of my theory for instance i sometimes created both the borrower and the building in the same transaction i have taken mortgages on a property which did not exist or which did not belong to the pretended borrower at other times when i have been in urgent need of money to meet some unforeseen exigency i have drawn bills payable to order and signed by the leading merchants of marseilles and which i have put into circulation at a loss after accepting them in my own name you see that i am hiding nothing from you and that i am accusing myself i am laying myself bare before you because i wish to justify myself and also because in future i must give over applying my system marius was utterly terrified he entered tremblingly the recesses of this man's mind he felt that he was in the presence of a moral phenomenon and he submitted to this strange confession like one submits to a nightmare it seemed to him that he was in the thick of the roar and smoke of some machine surrounded by the revolving gear so douglas resumed you quite understand what my system was 
in principle i wished to be a banker to turn to account the funds that passed through my hands i acquired on my own account properties which i fancied i could resell at a profit my system of fictitious names answered all requirements by the aid of these names i was able to deal with all who applied to me i have been according to the opportunity lender borrower purchaser and seller whenever the funds raised by my personal credit or the credit i had procured for the fictitious individuals did not suffice for my needs i obtained others by negotiating supposed loans on behalf of no matter who relative friend or client being careful later on to release that person's property the same as i had mortgaged it unbeknown to himself in a word my office became a banking establishment a thieving establishment exclaimed marius a forger's den douglas shrugged his shoulders you ought by now to understand me he said and to see that i never sought to rob a single one of my clients i have a hope that you will do me justice by and by i have now to tell you about my finest invention to administer the properties acquired and turn the borrowed monies to good account i conceived the idea of establishing agents acting under power of attorney who would represent in all matters my forty imaginary personages and to fill these posts i selected honourable young men who became my unconscious accomplices i had faith in my system and i should most certainly have enriched those who assisted me if unfortunate circumstances had not marred my success when i proposed to you to represent otier i desired solely as i have already told you to come to your assistance and give you a share in the profits of a speculation which i considered an excellent one these last words exasperated marius he could bear it no longer and he felt he would go mad if he continued to follow douglas's strange talk i have listened to you patiently he said shaking with indignation the rascalities you have been telling me of with such cool impudence prove to my mind that you are either a fool or a rogue not at all interrupted the notary striking the table with his fist you have certainly not understood me i have told you four or five times i'm a banker listen to me for goodness sake douglas rose and placed himself before marius there was nothing in his attitude to indicate either fear or shame you have called me a rogue and a thief said he softly and i let you insult me for you were accusing me in the name of society speaking as the crown attorney would speak when judging my conduct from the legal standpoint you must look at it from another point of view if you would understand me let us reason a bit a thief is he who steals another's property and makes off when his pockets are full is he not i have never for a moment thought of stealing i have been applying my system during six years and i am poorer now than when i first began my operations have not succeeded i have even lost some thousands of francs which were my own you know what my life has been i have lived on bread and water i have led the existence of an austere and indefatigable worker the only luxury i have allowed myself has been to give a little in charity a strange thief indeed who has lived in his office as in a cloister and who has handled enormous sums of money without even being tempted to steal a copper admit that if i were really a thief i should long ago have got together what funds i could and have bolted marius felt surprised and embarrassed he had not looked at the matter in that light the man was evidently right he could not be accused of robbery what shocks and incenses you resumed douglas is my system itself it has failed and i shall be considered a great criminal if it had succeeded i should have realized a large fortune without doing the slightest injury to any one i should have been immensely rich and the world would have esteemed me yes crime has been my base of operation i have speculated on forgery i have followed a new and bold line but to my mind success was certain i had faith in my activity it never occurred to me that i might drag another down in my fall that is wherein i was blind you see my course of proceeding i took mortgages on property which did not exist or which had already been mortgaged 
but i paid the interest on the money invested i put forged bills into circulation but i took them up at maturity my imaginary personages were so to say nothing more than borrowed names to cover myself and i made use of them simply to increase my speculations understand me well i wished above all to procure funds and turn them to account what matter the fictitious securities i emitted the forged documents the different means i employed to extend my credit and the sphere of my business in speculation the only reality is the profit one is able to draw more or less skilfully from a given capital take the stock exchange for instance there one trades on mere suppositions admit for a moment that by buying and selling properties by means of other people's money i had succeeded in doubling the capital i had illegally procured i should have refunded that capital in full have robbed nobody destroyed the forged documents and have retired with a fortune won by my labour and intelligence that's my system in its entirety having no fortune of my own i was obliged to borrow of my clients the principal necessary for carrying on my operations it was no theft but a mere loan on hearing douglas's clear and logical reasoning a kind of terror crept over marius the notary grew terribly in his eyes for a moment he looked upon him as some misguided genius who had employed his rare faculties of energy and daring in the cause of evil had the man had large means of action he might perhaps have accomplished great things there are some superior qualities residing in all criminals of douglas's calibre marius was above all surprised by the simple and natural manner in which the notary spoke of the forgeries he had committed his mind was undoubtedly disordered the man was ill the fever of speculation which devoured him had brought him little by little to look upon crime as an excellent medium provided the crime remained concealed and unpunished he had said it himself though he had forged he still considered himself an honest man so long as he caused no one to lose anything after a pause douglas went on shaking his head the while systems are always splendid practice alone opens your eyes to their defects in theory i should have won an immense fortune i don't know how it has happened but i am now overwhelmed with debt and i can see very well that all hope is gone my unfortunate operations have swallowed up over a million and my clients are ruined the notary's voice had grown feebler and emotion was filling his eyes with tears he walked feverishly up and down and as he did so he continued you've no idea what a frightful life i've been leading these past two years every one of my operations failed and i found myself face to face with terrible exigencies to preserve my credit to conceal my forgeries i have been daily obliged to commit others i no longer dreamed of making money i only thought of defending myself and escaping the galleys i take heaven to witness that had i been able to get back the money that was lost i would have reimbursed every one and then lived as a law-abiding citizen but the enormous amount of interest i had to pay crushed me i resold at a loss the properties i had acquired in spite of my struggles ill luck has clung to me and weighed me down to the very depths of ruin to-day my liabilities are considerable i cannot meet this fortnight's bills and for me a suspension of payment means penal servitude if the authorities were ever to examine my papers i should be at once arrested and put in prison marius almost felt disposed to pity the wretch douglas sat down again and resumed dejectedly after all though this is the end i've confessed to you and i know that you're about to hand me over to justice let it be so for my position is no longer bearable you're right i'm a scoundrel and i ought to be punished marius did not stir he was reflecting uncertain how to act one fear stayed him he did not wish to be mixed up in the matter in case he should be called as a witness and thus lose precious time which belonged to his mission moreover it was not his business to denounce the notary there was no escape now for the man he was fatally on the road to his punishment and would fall of his own accord into his judge's hands well why do you hesitate asked douglas 
you know all i'll await here the police officers you are going for the young man rose from his chair and tore up the documents containing his name you are a wretch he replied my judgment has not changed but there is no need for me to assist justice which will know how to punish you without my help your chastisement will come of itself and he walked out of the office here is the end of this episode on the morrow douglas unable to meet his engagements took to flight Marseilles was panic-stricken at the news several fortunes were compromised and it was impossible at first to gauge the full extent of the disaster it was a kind of public misfortune with the dismay of those concerned was mingled the astonishment of all honest persons they could not forgive the notary the hypocrisy with which he had deceived a whole city during several years douglas was caught and tried at aix in the midst of a terrible feeling of irritation he accepted his position with rare coolness without his assistance the authorities would never have succeeded in unravelling such an intricate affair the court had to pronounce on more than nine hundred deeds infected with every kind of forgery varied in so many ways that the human mind could not have conceived any combination of which the forger had not made use the misdeeds laid to his charge were so numerous were complicated with so many details and affected so great a number of victims that it would have been impossible to have seen clearly amidst the chaos without the assistance of him who after imagining and putting his crimes into execution could alone unravel the skein of them douglas set to work with indefatigable zeal and surprising truthfulness to clear up the disorder of his affairs and to fix his own position as well as those of his creditors and debtors he continued to energetically defend himself against the accusation of theft he repeated that he was an unfortunate speculator and if justice and circumstances had permitted him he would have retrieved his affairs as well as those of his clients he seemed to be accusing the court of binding his hands of preventing him repairing the harm he had done he was condemned to penal servitude for life and to be publicly exhibited in the pillory at marseilles End of chapter seven and eight part two chapters nine and ten of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine how an ugly man may become handsome it was now more than two months since marius and fine had returned to marseilles on leaving the notary's office the young man had to own to himself that up till then he had been wasting his time and that so far he had not obtained the first franc of the fifteen thousand he required for philippe's safety after all he knew only how to show his love and devotion he felt he had a soul too upright a mind too loyal and too generously artless for him to be able to procure in a few weeks the large sum he was so despairingly seeking he had always acted like a child the deplorable incidents with which he had recently found himself mixed up the loves of armand and sauveur douglas's hypocrisy and forgeries had shown him life under a terrifying aspect which discouraged him he retreated instead of advancing he feared in making another attempt to fail and even compromise himself by falling again into the hands of rogues who would take advantage of him in his suspicious state he saw nothing but snares around him such tender hearts ignorant of evil and desirous of good are predestined to be wounded and made to bleed at every hour of the day yet the month of december was drawing nigh and it was necessary to make haste if philippe was to be saved no further mercy would be shown and the condemned man would be undoubtedly fastened to the infamous pillory at that thought marius shed tears of impotence and weariness he would he could have freed his brother by some herculean task if he had been put to the proof he would have undertaken to pierce the prison wall with his nails to have scraped and crumbled the stone away beneath his fingers that laborious exploit would not have appeared to him a hard one and he would have succeeded in it although he wore his fingers to the bone but the thought of the fifteen thousand francs terrified him once it was a question of money of taking humiliating steps or of engaging in more or less equivocal dealings he went off his head and felt incapable of conducting the least enterprise to a successful conclusion this explained the artless confidence which had taken him to armand and douglas all hope however was not yet dead within him 
thanks to those same qualities which were his weakness to his kindly heart and upright mind he always returned to the thoughts of self-reliance and hope the lessons which the ignominies of life had taught him could not prevent him still believing in the helpful sympathy of others i have more than six weeks before me yet he thought it's impossible that i shall not find some true friend by then there's no reason for despair he would certainly have fallen ill with the anguish the hopes and disappointments of his task if he had not had a comforter at hand who smiled at him when most depressed a strong friendship had grown up between him and the cougourdans he went nearly every day to see fine and spent long evenings in her society at the beginning they talked together of philippe then whilst not forgetting the poor prisoner they conversed about themselves about their childhood and future these were chats quite free from all restraint which rested them after the fatigues and anxieties of the day and gave them fresh courage for the morrow every morning marius little by little began ardently to long for the evening in order to find himself back in fine's little room when he had a gleam of hope he ran to tell it to his friend and when he had met with some disappointment he also hastened to relate it to her and be consoled it was only there in that clean and tidy attic which smelt so sweet and looked so gay that he felt at ease in the midst of his tender sadness one evening he persisted in helping the young woman who was making up some bouquets for the morrow's sale he took a childish delight in removing the thorns from the roses in gathering up the pinks into slender bunches in delicately taking one by one the violets and marguerites and handing them to fine from that time he became a florist every evening between eight and ten the work amused him he said and quieted his anxieties if ever his fingers touched fines when handing her the flowers he felt a gentle warmth rise to his face the strange uneasiness the penetrating emotion he then experienced was no doubt the sole cause of his sudden inclination for making bouquets marius was certainly a simpleton he would have been much surprised even hurt if any one told him that he was falling in love with fine he would have exclaimed that he knew he was much too ugly to dare to love the young woman and that moreover such a love born and developed in the shadow of his brother's misfortune would have seemed to him a crime but his heart would soon have protested he had never lived much in the society of a woman and had let himself be caught by the first affectionate glance bestowed upon him fine consoling and encouraging him ever ready with a caressing smile and a warm pressure of the hand seemed to him at first both a sister and a mother whom heaven had sent him in his affliction the truth was that unbeknown to himself this sister this mother was becoming a bride a bride whom he already loved with all the tender and devoted ardour of his heart and this love was bound to spring up between two young people who wept and smiled in company chance had brought them together and their goodness was uniting them they were worthy of each other they possessed the all-powerful sympathy of devotion for some time past a sly smile which marius had failed to notice had been playing about fine's lips she guessed the young man loved her long before he himself had become aware of his love women have a special gift of penetrating this sort of secret they can read in their lovers eyes and see into the innermost recesses of their souls the flower-girl however was careful to hide her blushes she schooled herself to remain marius's cordial friend and not to open his eyes by a warmer grasp of the hand to see them each evening seated opposite one another with a table covered with roses between them one would have taken them for brother and sister on sundays fine went to st henri she felt a sort of sympathetic pity a compassionate friendship for blanche the poor young girl who was soon to become a mother and whose life was for ever blighted became every day dearer to her she saw her remorse her tears of regret she assisted at her disconsolate existence and sought by her visits to assuage her misery she brought her bright smile to that little house by the sea where blanche was weeping as she thought of philippe and her unborn babe it was like a holy pilgrimage for the flower girl and she accomplished it religiously she started off about midday after luncheon and remained till dusk with mademoiselle de Casalis. in the evening as night was falling she found marius waiting for her on the seashore and they returned together to marseilles on foot arm in arm like a young married couple marius tasted pure joy during these walks sunday evening became for him the reward of all his efforts of the week he waited for fine by the sea forgetful of his sorrows feverishly watching for the young woman's arrival then when she was there 
they smiled at each other and returned slowly in the soft shadows of the gathering night exchanging words of friendship and hope never did the young man think the road long enough one sunday marius arrived early as a feeling of delicacy prevented him calling at blanche's house and so adding to her grief he sat down on the cliff which rises near the village and took patience in watching the blue immensity spread out before him he remained there nearly two hours lost in a vague reverie in thoughts of love and happiness which softly lulled him the immense horizon moved him unconsciously his love for fine rose from his heart to his lips the sea and sky the infinity of the waters and the air affected him opened his soul he beheld but fine in the boundless sea he heard but her name in the dull and regular murmur of the waves the flower-girl arrived and seated herself on the rock beside the young man who took her hand without speaking before them was spread the sea and heavens both of a soft pale blue twilight was falling profound serenity was alike enfeebling the last sounds and the last rays thin rosy gleams in the west were casting their delicate reflections on the rocks of the shore there was a breath of tenderness in the air a great quivering voice which grew softer and softer deeply moved marius kept his friend's hand in his as he continued his dream his eyes fixed on the horizon on that vague haze where heaven and sea mingled together he was smiling sadly and in a low voice and quite unconsciously his lips gave utterance to the thoughts of his heart no no he murmured i am too ugly from the moment marius took her hand fine had been smiling in her sly and tender way at last her friend was going to make up his mind to speak she guessed it from the deeper look in his eyes his tighter grasp when she heard the young man say he was too ugly she seemed surprised and annoyed too ugly she exclaimed but you are quite handsome marius fine had put so much feeling into the cry which had escaped her that marius looked round and clasped his hands as he gazed at her anxiously she feeling that she had abruptly delivered up the secret of her heart lowered her face which became covered with blushes she remained thus speechless and embarrassed during some seconds but she was not the girl to withdraw from the complete avowal of her love she possessed too much frankness and sprightiness to indulge in the hypocritical comedy which most young persons in love go through on similar occasions she courageously raised her face and looked straight at marius who was trembling listen my friend she said to him i wish to speak frankly six months ago i hardly thought of you at all i considered you to be ugly no doubt i had never really looked at you to-day i think you are quite handsome i don't know how it has happened i assure you in spite of her resolution she hesitated a little and sudden blushes again covered her cheeks she stopped short unable to tell marius plainly that she loved him she knew the young man's timidity and had spoken solely to encourage him marius remained in his state of tender ecstasy he required no more and would have remained there on the cliff all night without seeking to obtain from fine a more complete avowal she was growing impatient the story of her love was a simple one at first she had admired philippe's tall frame and energetic countenance with that blindness of young girls which prompts them to choose handsome lads those who carry all their beauty on their faces and none in their souls then wounded to the heart by the indifference of blanche's lover seeing at last clearly into his vain nature she had begun to look more severely upon his conduct and had become little by little estranged from him it was at this time that she found herself frequently with marius in an intimacy which brought them closer and closer together in this instance love had been born of kindliness marius ugly to the eyes became beautiful for the heart at first fine had seen in him merely a disheartened friend who needed help she had undertaken half his task in a sisterly way prompted a little by love for philippe and a great deal by a natural desire to be serviceable she had therefore joined marius and their common thought of deliverance had united them more each day it was thus that their affection grew they loved each other through their self-devotion whilst living on the same hope and working for the same object and it was in the accomplishment of this generous task that marius became handsome the comparison which fine could not help drawing between philippe and marius made the latter appear an exceptional being the charming prince of a young girl's dreams 
marius's countenance became forthwith transfigured in her eyes it appeared to her quite handsome with all the beauty of his loyal and tender nature she would have been immensely surprised had any one told her her lover was ugly marius could still hear the young woman's cry that cry of the heart which as good as told him you are handsome and i love you he dared not speak fearing to dispel the sweet dream which was so deliciously soothing his mind fine in her embarrassment continued to smile you don't believe me she asked speaking merely for the sake of speaking and scarcely knowing what she was saying yes i believe you marius replied in a low deep voice i need to believe you when you were not there the murmur of the waves told me a secret i don't know what is the matter with the sea and the sky this evening they speak in so sweet a voice that they have moved my heart and disturbed my mind at this close of day amidst the sadness of the twilight i have just discovered within myself a happiness i had never dreamed of would you like to know the secret the waves whispered in my ear yes said the young woman while her emotion caused her hand to tremble marius leant towards her and murmured in a faint and timid tone of voice the waves told me that i loved you the shadows were falling more grey and solemn in the heavens lights appeared amid a milky transparency the dark blue motionless sea was slumbering as it wafted its sluggish heavy breath fresh and briny odours arose borne by the evening breeze and the serenity of space spread in the advancing night the hour was a fit one for an avowal of love a divine tenderness a smiling calm came from the vast compassionate sea at the foot of the cliff the waves were slowly breaking lulling the sleeping coast whilst from the earth still hot and feverish rose a fierce breath of passion it seemed as though the vast sea was adding its voice to marius's tender words well said the flower girl gaily the waves are chatterboxes but did they tell you the truth yes yes he exclaimed the waves spoke the truth i feel it now my friend i have been loving you for months past ah what a lot of good this avowal does me for a long time past i have felt there was something wanting when i was in your presence i became penetrated by some pleasant sensation i could hear some indistinct voices within me and i could not make out what they were whispering now the silence of this cliff has sufficed for me to hear them tell of my love fine listened to marius's words with a smile on her lips the shadows were becoming more and more bluish and mysterious marius hesitated for a moment then asked in a soft and humble tone of voice you are not angry at what i am telling you i know very well that you cannot love me you know nothing at all replied fine with abrupt tenderness good heavens what a time you are making up your mind my answer has been ready for more than a month past and what is it ask the waves the young woman answered with a laugh she held out her hands to marius who kissed them passionately it was now quite dark and the dull moan of the sea lingered voluptuously in the gloom the young man bent over the young woman and their lips met then they talked as lovers do in the puerile way of children going from recollections of the past to projects for the future their voices were a music which caressed them and they talked to hear each other speak to feel one another's warm breath play about their faces they were so happy in the obscurity in face of the infinite which lay open before them listen said fine we will get married when your brother is free philippe must be placed in safety first at the mention of philippe's name marius shuddered he had forgotten his brother the sad reality rose before him for two hours he had been living in the seventh heaven and now he had fallen back to the earth from the height of his dream philippe he murmured despondently yes we must think of him oh heavens is my happiness already dead you love my brother do you not for mercy's sake tell me the truth fine said nothing but burst into sobs the young man's words were breaking her heart in his despair he pressed for an answer and at last the flower girl cried i love you because you are good because you know how to love so you see well enough that i cannot love philippe there was such a burst of faith and love in this cry that marius at last understood 
he placed his arms around her in a sudden transport of adoration and then he had a slight feeling of remorse we are happy he observed and egotistical whilst we are breathing here the free air of heaven our brother is pining in prison ah we know not how to work for his deliverance yes you'll see fine replied you'll see what one can do when one's in love and loved in return they remained hand in hand without saying another word while the sea continued to lull their love with its monotonous voice the stars were shining brightly as they re-entered marseilles their hearts full of their young hopes and affection chapter x hostilities are renewed blanche passed her days in tears the autumn was giving a pale hue to the melancholy horizon the season was becoming cold and dreary chill blasts stirred the sea whose voice had changed into a wail whilst the trees were casting their leaves upon the ground beneath the mournful nudity of the heavens lay the bareness of the sea and shore this sadness of the air this last farewell of summer spread over blanche's surroundings the despair which already filled her heart she led a retired life in the little house by the shore it was situated a short distance from the village of st henri stood alone upon a cliff and overlooked the sea which beat against the rocks beneath the windows blanche would spend whole days together watching and listening to the waves whose constant noise soothed her sufferings this was her sole diversion she followed with her eyes the great sheets of foam which broke and leapt into the air her aching being found relief in presence of the mild and monotonous immensity occasionally of an evening she would go out accompanied by her companion she would descend to the seashore and seat herself on a fragment of rock the cool night breeze calmed the fever that was consuming her she would linger in the darkness deafened by the breaking of the waves upon the beach and not return home until she was shivering with the cold the same thought was ever oppressing her at each succeeding hour it was there overwhelming inexorable in the chilliness of the night or the warmth of the day in presence of the infinite or before the void of darkness blanche thought of philippe and her unborn babe fine was her great consoler if the flower-girl had not consented to spend the sunday afternoons with her the poor young creature would have died of despair she felt an imperious need of confiding her grief to some kind soul solitude frightened her for when she found herself alone again her remorse rose before her like a spectre and filled her with terror directly fine arrived they both went up to a little room where they shut themselves into talk and weep undisturbed the window stood open and far away on the blue velvet of the sea white sails would pass like messengers of hope and on each occasion the same tears were shed the same words spoken heart-rending and pathetic oh how gloomy life is said blanche i have been thinking all day of the hours i passed with philippe among the rocks of jaume garde and the Infernet. i ought to have killed myself in those gulfs have fallen down some precipice why be always weeping ever regretting fine gently replied you're no longer a little girl and have sacred duties to fulfil for heaven's sake think of the present and no longer linger in an ever irreparable past you will end by making yourself ill by killing your child blanche shuddered kill my child she resumed amidst her sobs do not say that the child must live to atone for my transgression and obtain my pardon ah philippe was right when he said that i should belong to him for ever though i denied him i have vainly tried to tear the memory of him from my heart my pride has been crushed and i have been obliged to yield to the love filled with remorse which is torturing me and to-day i love philippe more than i ever did before with all my regrets and all my despair fine said nothing she would have liked to have seen blanche stronger and prepared for the difficult task maternity was about to bring her but mademoiselle de cazalis was always the poor weak creature who could do nothing but cry the flower-girl determined to act herself when the time came if you knew continued blanche how i suffer when you're not here i feel philippe torturing me he lives again in my child and is ever with me reproaching me with my perjury he is always before me or about me i can see him on his pallet in his cell 
i hear him complaining and cursing me i would i had no heart then i might live in peace come you must be calm said fine with such despair consolation is often powerless the young woman assisted with a certain terror at these scenes of distress she studied blanche's shattered love like a physician studies some strange and terrible malady and said to herself that is how one suffers that is what one becomes when one loves timidly one day when in one of her fits of despair blanche said in a broken voice with her eyes fixed upon her companion you are going to marry him are you not fine did not at first understand blanche who added hastily hide nothing from me i would rather know all you are a good girl and will make him happy and i prefer to see him married to you than to know he is gadding about marseilles when i am dead tell him that i always loved him and she burst into sobs the flower girl gently took her hands i beg you she said think no more of your lover but think of your child if possible forget everything for it besides be easy i shall never marry philippe though i may become his sister his sister interrupted mademoiselle de cazalis yes answered fine smiling sweetly as she thought of marius i love and am beloved and she told her the story of her love appeasing her fever by speaking to her of marius as she listened to the recital of this peaceful courtship blanche's tears fell less fast from that day forth she loved fine far more she felt only a faint sadness when thinking of philippe and determined to devote herself to her child true love the devoted generous love of her friend had entered her heart sometimes fine found abbe chastanier in the little house on the cliff the priest took blanche the consolation of religion he sustained her by talking to her of heaven by withdrawing her thoughts from the world and its passions he would have liked to have seen mademoiselle de cazalis enter a convent for he felt that there was no longer any happiness possible for her amid the pleasures of society she would have to remain everlastingly a widow and she did not possess the strength of mind necessary to make herself a peaceful existence in her widowhood but the poor priest was very ignorant of matters relating to the heart blanche much preferred to weep with fine whilst talking of philippe than to listen to abbe chastanier's sermons yet the old man spoke to her at times in profound accents and the girl looked at him with surprise seized with a desire to penetrate into the peaceful world in which he lived she wished to kneel down to remain for ever in obeisance absorbed in an ecstasy that would have delivered her from all her sufferings it was thus that she became little by little that which she was destined to be a servant of god one of those holy women whom the world has wounded and who ascend to heaven before their death one day abbe chastanier remained till evening and left with fine he had to tell the flower girl some bad news which he did not wish to mention before blanche he found marius on the shore awaiting his sweetheart my dear child he said there is more trouble in store for you m de cazalis wrote to me yesterday he is much surprised that the sentence pronounced against your brother has not yet been carried out and informs me he is taking steps to hasten the date of the public exhibition in the pillory how are you getting on do you hope soon to secure the prisoner's release well no replied marius sorrowfully i am no farther advanced than on the first day i hope to have still at least six weeks before me i do not think the abbe resumed that m de cazalis will be able to induce the president to break with us besides our interview has remained secret and that makes me believe that the exhibition will not take place till the end of december as promised but i advise you to make haste one can never say what may happen and i thought it right to let you know what i had been told fine and marius were in dismay they returned to marseilles with the priest silently and again a prey to their anguish their love had in a sense blinded them during a week and now they once more beheld the same abyss before them End of chapters nine and ten Part two Chapters eleven, twelve, and thirteen of the Mysteries of Marseilles by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eleven Douglas in the Pillory at Marseilles. 
some few mornings afterwards towards nine o'clock as marius was on his way to his office he found the rue paradis full of a noisy crowd which was going in the direction of the Canbière. he stopped at the corner of the rue de la Dasse, and standing on tiptoe caught a glimpse of the place royale full of people it was like a sea of human heads the unceasing flow of the crowd about him continued on its way with a noisy hum the keen curiosity evinced by the mob gradually took hold of marius also stray words which he caught from time to time filled him with vague anxiety and he also wished to go and see he allowed himself to be carried along by the crowd which was streaming down the street like a torrent he easily reached the place royale but there the throng which surged from the rue paradis broke itself against a compact immovable mass of people all were standing on tiptoe and looking in the direction of the Canbière. the young man obtained a vague view of some soldiers on horseback he could distinguish nothing else and did not yet guess what painful sight could thus attract the entire population of the city the crowd about him was shouting voices gave utterance to sudden sharp words which rose above the discordant hum of the multitude and reached him distinctly he arrived from aix during the night yes and he'll start to-morrow for toulon i should like to see what figure he cuts they say he burst into sobs when he saw the executioner bring the cords no no he kept up well believe me he's a plucky fellow who doesn't weep like a woman ah the scoundrel the people should stone him i shall try and get nearer wait for me they must be hooting him there i want to join in these words interspersed with jeers and yelled out with angry gesticulations sounded cruelly in marius's ears a genuine terror seized him and a cold sweat broke out on his forehead he was frightened and incapable of reasoning he asked himself in his anguish who the man could be whom the mob was hurrying to insult the crowd was growing denser and more eager every moment and he saw that he would never be able to pierce the formidable mass before him so he decided to get round the place royale he went slowly down the rue vacon took the rue beauvau and eventually reached the Canbière. there a strange sight awaited him the whole extent of the Canbière, from the harbour to the cour bazins was filled with an immense mob which was added to every minute throngs of people were streaming down every street at times a breath of anger rushed through the crowd and then shouts arose spread like vast billows with the deep murmur of the sea all the windows were filled with spectators urchins had climbed up the shop fronts along the houses all marseilles was there and each head was eagerly gazing in the same direction there were more than sixty thousand persons on the Canbière staring and hooting when marius had succeeded in drawing near he then understood what kind of sight was attracting and detaining the crowd in the centre of the Canbière, opposite the place royale stood a scaffold made of rough planks on which was a man tied to a post two companies of infantry a picket of mounted gendarmerie and chasseurs were drawn round the platform and protecting the culprit against the increasing fury of the mob at first marius only beheld the wretch fastened to the pillory and towering above the crowd a horrible anxiety made him seek to see the man's face perhaps it was philippe perhaps m de casalis had succeeded in having the date of the execution of the sentence advanced at that thought marius's sight became confused tears filled his eyes and there was like a thick cloud hanging before his gaze which prevented him distinguishing anything he leant against a shop feeling faint and stabbed to the heart by each shout of the crowd in his feverish state he ended by really believing that he recognized his brother on the scaffold that it was indeed philippe who was there and whom the multitude was insulting the shame pain and pity which then took possession of him filled him with atrocious anguish during several minutes he remained like one annihilated then he recovered sufficient courage to raise his head and look the wretched man was firmly tied to the post he wore a vest and trousers of grey canvas his head was covered by a cap and he had drawn the peak down over his eyes he obstinately held his head bent thus preventing the spectators seeing his features his face was turned towards the port and he never once raised his head to gaze at the broad sea which spread out before him free and happy when marius had again looked at the prisoner he felt a doubt and with it relief the man seemed twice as stout as his brother 
moreover he knew philippe and was confident that he would not have bowed his head thus but would have considered it a duty to return the crowd scorn for scorn yet marius still had a vague fear the hidden face disquieted him he would have liked to have had a clear view of the culprit's features all about the young man the mob continued to utter exclamations yells of anger or irony hold up your head you rogue show us your face you scoundrel oh he'll never look up he's frightened well he's harmless now he's got his hands tied and will never again rob anybody you think so do you he almost stole his pardon yes yes some rich people pious people tried to have him spared the ignominy of the pillory a poor man wouldn't have met with such sympathy but the king didn't give way he said the punishment must be the same for all scoundrels whether high or low oh the king's a good fellow hi douglas rogue rascal thief hypocrite you won't play any more of your pranks my friend you won't go again to church to pray to have your forgeries concealed marius breathed more freely the cries he heard told him at last who was the sufferer then he recognized douglas he caught a distinct view of the ex-notary's pale fat face but in the innermost recesses of his heart he thought of his brother and remembered that philippe also might have to confront the jeers and howls of the mob the multitude was still roaring he's ruined more than fifty families penal servitude is too light a punishment for him we should take the law into our own hands yes that's it we'll capture him and lynch him when he passes by look how comfortable he seems up there he doesn't suffer half enough he ought to be hung up by his feet ah there's the executioner about to untie him come along it was true and douglas left the scaffold he was placed in a little open cart drawn by a single horse which was to take him back to the prison at this moment there was a great commotion amongst the people everybody rushed forward to hoot and perhaps kill the wretch but the foot soldiers surrounded the cart whilst those on horseback galloped about and broke up the mob marius looked a last time at the culprit with intense pity the man was no doubt very guilty but the cavalry of shame he was ascending turned him rather into an object of commiseration than of anger the young man had remained leaning against a shop as he was watching the departure of the cart he heard two workmen who were passing by say we'll come back next month you know they're going to exhibit that fellow who carried off the young lady it'll be more amusing ah yes philippe Cayol. i knew him he's a big chap we must find out the proper day so as not to miss it there'll be a fine to do the workmen went off and marius remained with a pale face and a an aching heart the men were right in a month's time it would be his brother's turn and he reflected that chance had caused him to assist at all the horrors philippe would have to go through he knew now what sufferings awaited him he could fancy him in douglas's place and pictured to himself the horrible scene that would be enacted his anguish kept him a long time with closed eyes and ears full of a confused hum he was seeing philippe on the scaffold and listening to the laughing crowd insulting him chapter twelve marius loses his wits as marius was leaning against the shop front his eyes fixed on the ground and deeply affected by the scene at which he had been assisting he felt a hand laid on his shoulder with friendly roughness he looked up and beheld sauvaire the master stevedore before him well my young friend what on earth are you doing there sauvaire exclaimed with a hearty laugh one would think you were going to be tied to that post and he pointed to the scaffold sauvaire was gaily dressed he wore a coat and trousers of fine cloth and his partly buttoned waistcoat gave a view of his white shirt his heavy watch-chain with its massive charms was displayed complacently as it was scarcely ten o'clock the master stevedore was still in his slippers with his soft felt hat cocked on his head and his beautiful meerschaum pipe between his teeth one felt that the whole pavement of the canbiere belonged to him he was quite at home there occupying as much room as possible and watching the passers-by in a familiar and patronizing way with his hands in his pockets stretching out his trousers his legs wide apart he examined marius with a look of superiority that was full of condescension you seem worried and ill he added do as i do keep well eat and drink heartily lead a merry life 
ah as for me i don't know what grief is i'm strong i've got a good digestion and i can spend a hundred francs whenever i like i know one must be well off to do as i do everybody isn't rich he eyed marius pitifully and found him so puny and pale that he was delighted at feeling himself plump and red beside him at that moment he would willingly have lent the young man a thousand francs marius was not listening to his prating he had shaken his hand in an absent-minded way and then had plunged again in his gloomy thoughts he was thinking with despair that he had been vainly struggling for three months without having made the slightest headway the post erected before him was a waiting philippe and it seemed to him that his feet were rooted to the pavement and that he was unable to run to his brother's assistance at that moment he would have sold himself to obtain a few thousand francs he would have committed a mean action receiving no reply sauvert continued prating he liked to hear the sound of his own voice deuce take it he said a young man should amuse himself but poor you you don't amuse yourself enough you work too hard my young friend ah it requires a lot of money pleasures cost dear as for myself i some weeks spend enormous sums you can't amuse yourself as much as that it'd be impossible but yet you might have a bit of a fling you've got a trifle of money haven't you listen shall i take you some evenings to places that'll enliven you up the master stevedore thought himself very generous in making marius this proposal he waited a while for the young man to thank him but as he still maintained his silence of despair he took his arm in an authoritative way and led him along the pavement i'll take you in hand he exclaimed i'll show you life i intend you to be almost as lively as myself in a week's time i eat in the best restaurants i know the prettiest women in marseilles and as you see i stroll about all day that's the way to live he stopped and folding his arms planted himself abruptly before marius do you know at what time i went to bed he resumed at three o'clock this morning and would you like to know where i passed the night at the corneille club where there was a fine old gamble just fancy there were two delightful creatures there women attired in velvet with jewels and lace things so costly that one is afraid to touch them with the tips of one's fingers clairon a little dark woman won over five thousand francs marius looked up sharply ah he said in a strange voice can one win five thousand francs in a single night sauvert burst out laughing good heavens what a simpleton you are i have seen larger sums than that one some people have luck last year i knew a young man who won sixteen thousand francs in a couple of nights he came to the club with me and hadn't a copper on him i lent him five francs and two days after he was in possession of sixteen thousand we spent them together heavens didn't i just amuse myself during the month they lasted a red flush came to marius's face he felt a tremor pass up him and burn his chest he had never before experienced so painful a sensation doesn't one have to be a member of a club to be able to play there he asked the master stevedore smiled and winked his eye in a knowing manner shrugging his shoulders the while i thought resumed marius that strangers were not allowed in a club and that only the members who had paid a subscription could play there yes yes that's correct replied sauvert laughing only members have the right to play but strangers who have not that right are generally more numerous around the gaming-table and play for higher stakes than the members do you understand it was now marius who took hold of sauvert's arm and they went a few steps in silence then the young man asked his companion in a stifled voice could you take me to-night to the cornet club bravo exclaimed the master stevedore we'll have a laugh i see you're beginning to understand life look you wine love and cards that's the ticket for me when i saw you looking so pale i said to myself there's a youngster i must take in hand try and win some money be quick and get a sweetheart and you'll soon grow fat or the devil take me certainly i'll conduct you to-night to the corneille club and i'll introduce you to clairon marius made a movement of impatience 
he cared nothing for clairon a fixed idea was occupying his brain since it was possible to win sixteen thousand francs at play in a couple of nights he wished to tempt fortune and obtain philippe's ransom from chance and he said to himself that providence would watch over him that he would leave the club with his hands full of gold something had gone wrong in his healthy upright mind beneath the repeated blows of disaster the good sense he possessed had become clouded everything was weighing him down in bringing him the news of m de cazalis's fresh proceedings abbe chastanier had dealt him the first blow then douglas in the pillory that terrible sight had completed his perturbation driving him mad by spreading before his eyes the spectacle of the infamous punishment that awaited his brother he was now quite losing his wits reduced to powerlessness not knowing where to turn in his supreme anguish he looked upon gambling as a providential means which would either help him out of his difficulty or plunge him more deeply into the abyss of his despair besides he was acting in a state of fever no longer knowing what he was doing obeying simply the instincts of the beast he looked at sauvaire wondering whether it was virtue or crime which had placed this man across his path at the moment when the thought of the steps the deputy was taking and of philippe's punishment was torturing him at that instant he would have accepted anything he would have fought ill luck with no matter what weapons well that's agreed resumed sauvaire as he took leave where shall i meet you this evening i'll be here on the canebiere at ten o'clock replied marius he left the master stevedore and went to his office he had never before been in such a state of over-excitement he passed a terrible day shaking with fever his brow heated a vacant gaze in his eyes and full of eager desire as he thought of the night that was coming he was dreaming awake and beheld the gold heaping up before him he fancied himself already rich and imagined his brother was free in the evening he went to see fine as usual at about eight o'clock the young woman noticed how heated his hands were whatever is the matter with you she asked him anxiously he stammered and hurried away with the words don't ask me anything philippe will be free and we shall all live happily he called at his lodging to take a hundred francs which he had saved up one by one and then went to meet sauvaire at ten o'clock they both entered the corneille club chapter thirteen the gambling houses of marseilles before relating the next episode of this drama before showing marius a prey to all the anxieties of the gambler it is necessary to explain the causes which led to the increase of gambling houses in marseilles the writer of these lines would like to display in all its hideous nakedness the festering sore which preyed upon one of the wealthiest and liveliest cities of france the reader will pardon his short digression in consideration of its usefulness it is to be observed that the passion for gambling plays the most havoc in the great centres of commerce when a whole population is given over to unbridled speculation when all classes in a city are trafficking from morn to eve it is almost impossible that this throng of dealers should not plunge into the keen emotions of gambling gaming then becomes an additional speculation to be added to the others people speculate on chance and continue during the night the occupation of the day during the daytime they have been trying to increase their fortune by selling no matter what and at night-time they seek to add to the profit by risking it at the gaming-table if it is true that trade is often a game the traders may believe that they are not going out of their element when they pass from their counters to the neighboring gambling-houses the commercial fever too is contagious in the face of certain great fortunes accumulated in a few years there is not a young man at marseilles who does not dream of similar luck every one wishes to go into business the whole city is an enormous bank in which one lives merely for the sake of making money go down to the port walk into all the places where the crowd is densest you will find every one talking of money and will fancy yourself in some immense office where all conversations are about figures the important business is when one has ten francs in one's pocket to turn them into twenty thirty forty those with large capital gamble at the stock exchange buying and selling but folks who only possess a few francs have recourse to gaming not having sufficient to engage in vast enterprises they satisfy their craving by tempting chance it is a means of gaining fortune or meeting ruin which is within every one's grasp a prompt and easy method a new style of trade full of keen emotions 
the gambler is a speculator who lives a whole panting existence in a night and experiences the hope anxiety and despair of a stock jobber in a city like marseilles where money reigns as sovereign king where the inhabitants are under the influence of a terrible commercial fever gambling becomes a necessity a sort of bank open to all in which each one both rich and poor can risk his coppers or his gold add to this the fact that the wealthy those who shovel gold about who gain enormous sums in a day set little value on that gold they pile up so easily a workman looks with reverence at the five-franc piece which is paid him in the evening he has toiled and moiled to earn the coin it represents to him an exhausting labour long hours of fatigue and he has to live on it but a trader a stock-jobber who whilst remaining seated in his office finds at evening that he has gained several hundreds of francs does not fear when pocketing his profit to let a few twenty-franc pieces fall to the ground he knows that on the morrow he will no doubt earn as many more he is still young and wishes to enjoy life as he has been shut in during several hours he requires in the evening some noisy pleasures and strong emotions so he squanders his money in the restaurants and cafes and at the gaming-table spending it as easily as he earned it a commercial city is therefore forcibly dissolute and given to gambling in this ebb and flow of fortunes in this scorching breath of trade which penetrates throughout every house there are hours of madness imperious needs for enjoyment at certain times these people are blinded by the dazzle of the gold they plunge into debauchery the same as they plunged into business and the fever lays hold of the town from one end to the other little and big rich and poor are agitated by the same emotion the same need to lose or win gold down to ruin or up to millions one can understand the existence of i was almost saying the necessity for gambling houses at marseilles at the time of this story there were more than a hundred of them and the number was increasing daily the police were vanquished by the passion of the gamblers whenever a gambling-house was discovered and closed two others were opened in its immediate neighbourhood to cut off the evil at the root it was necessary to remove the fever that was agitating the whole population but to my mind the evil was irremediable one may kill man but not his passions the police who have a direct action on gambling-houses close all those they discover but their action is difficult to apply in the clubs which at times become changed into veritable houses for gaming gamblers are inventive when it is a question of satisfying their passion they endeavour to have the law on their side understand well however what i mean to say i have no idea of attacking certain honourable clubs at marseilles i wish merely to be the historian of those scandalous clubs frequented by sharpers and sometimes terribly stained by the blood of suicide this is how a club is founded a few persons ask for an authorization to meet of an evening in a certain place for the purposes of conversation and refreshment and even to play at lawful games each member pays a subscription and it is forbidden to admit strangers that is to say to keep a gaming table open to the public and now this is what happens after a few months conversation and drinking cease and whole nights are spent around the green bays the stakes at first very small gradually increase in amount so much so that it is easy to ruin oneself in a few nights the management is no longer so strict any one is free to enter there are more strangers in the club than members even women are admitted sharpers soon put in an appearance for the purpose of fleecing inexperienced players and this state of things lasts until the police make a raid and close the premises two months later the club reopens some distance off the farce is played over again with the same ending this is one of the open sores of marseilles a festering sore which spreads every day the clubs have always a tendency to become gambling houses abysses which swallow up the fortunes and honour of those imprudent enough to venture therein and once one has tasted the keen delights of play all other pleasures seem to cloy the fever seizes hold of one's whole being and the table claims the last coin in one's purse not a week goes by without some fresh disaster or complaint to the authorities one time it is merchants who have been ruining themselves at the gaming tables they come there and jeopardize the money deposited with them first dissipating their own profits and then breaking into the funds that have been entrusted to their commercial probity after that they are obliged to go into bankruptcy and they drag down in their ruin those who have had faith in their honesty 
another time it is small clerks with appetites for luxury and fast living and whose modest salaries are insufficient for the gratification of their passions they see around them wealthy people wallowing in the lap of luxury surrounded by lovely women reclining in carriages in short tasting of all the dissolute joys of life they are seized with jealousy and feel a keen desire to lead a similar existence of pleasure and festivity so they seek to obtain the necessary money at the gaming-table they first of all risk their salaries then when luck is against them they rob their employers and enter upon a criminal career then again there are young men poor simple fellows fresh from college who become the prey of skilful sharpers if they win they plunge into debauchery if they lose they fall into debt give bills to usurers and eat their corn in the ear the following characteristic story is told a clerk who had been given a few thousand francs by his employer to pay the duty on some merchandise went that evening to a club and lost the money with which he had been entrusted at baccarat it was a temporary madness the clerk being an honest fellow who had succumbed to the gambling fever the employer threatened to make a complaint to the authorities on hearing this the members of the club met together and decided to restore to the employer out of their own pockets the sum which his clerk had misappropriated when they had paid up the clerk signed a bill to the order of the cashier of the club and the cashier has never insisted on the payment of this bill which the poor clerk was unable to meet is not this kind action on the gambler's part an admission they understood that they were all jointly and severally guilty of the embezzlement and they hushed up the affair so that the authorities should not come and disturb them in the gratification of their passion it was into this world stricken with madness into this company of excited gamblers that sauveur introduced marius End of chapters eleven twelve and thirteen part two chapter fourteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen in which marius wins ten thousand francs the cornet club was one of those authorized gambling hells that were referred to in the preceding chapter in principle it should only have comprised members admitted by a majority of voices and paying a subscription of twenty-five francs but in reality every one could go there and gamble at the commencement to save appearances they were in the habit of pasting a list of the newcomers up on the glass or else strangers were obliged to give a card of introduction supplied by one of the members later on they omitted to ask for the card and they had not taken the trouble to post up the names any one could go there who liked of course the master stevedore was an upright man incapable of committing a base action but his life of pleasure had caused him to make strange friendships he naively said that he preferred the society of rogues to that of straightforward people for while the latter worried him the former made him laugh he sought low society by instinct because he could there unbutton himself at his ease and amuse himself as he pleased that is to say by making a frightful riot besides with his affected air of a simple easy man he concealed extraordinary cunning and prudence he never compromised himself gambled little and withdrew as soon as he ran the least danger he was aware of the shady reputation of the majority of the frequenters of the cornet club and he went there because he met with ladies who were the reverse of being straight-laced and was able to satisfy his inclinations of an upstart sauveur and marius after ascending a narrow staircase reached a spacious apartment on the first floor where a score of marble-topped tables were set out against the walls were divans covered with red velvet and in the centre rush-seated chairs you might have imagined yourself in a cafe at the end was a large table covered with green cloth on which two squares were marked out with red braid and between these was a well for the cards that had been used this was the gaming-table it was surrounded by chairs marius cast a bewildered look over the place on entering he was suffocating like a man who had just fallen into the water any one to look at him might have thought that he had just come into a cavern where wild beasts were about to devour him his heart was beating rapidly and his brow covered with perspiration a sort of timidity mingled with repugnance kept him motionless awkward and gave him an embarrassed appearance there was hardly any one in the room a few men were drinking 
two women were conversing excitedly in a low tone in the corner the gaming-table remained dark and unoccupied in the background for the gas burners which descended in the centre of the green cloth had not yet been lit marius regained his assurance little by little but the fever continued raging in his veins what will you take inquired sauvaire whatever you like answered the young man in an off-hand way staring at the table with curiosity and alarm the master stevedore ordered beer he extended himself full length on a divan and lit a cigar ah there is clairon along with her friend isnard he all at once exclaimed perceiving the two girls talking in a corner look what pearls of women they are eh what say you they are the sort of little creatures you require to drive away your troubles marius looked at the girls clairon wore an old black velvet gown stained and frayed she was short dark faded her face which was pale and covered with yellow spots wore an air of weariness which was painful to look at isnard who was tall and thin appeared still older and more worn out it seemed as if her angular limbs would pierce through her faded silk gown at the shoulders marius was at a loss to understand sauvaire's passionate admiration for these creatures he turned away his head with an expression of disgust fine's healthy countenance had just appeared to him and he felt ashamed at being in such a place the high key of sauvaire's voice had made the two girls turn their heads and they began to laugh oh they are buxom lasses murmured the master stevedore there's no morning in their society if you like we'll take them off with us to-night aren't we going to play inquired marius sharply interrupting his companion good heavens what a hurry you are in answered sauvaire who stretched himself out still more to attract the girl's attention of course we are going to play we'll play until to-morrow morning if you like but dash it there's time enough for that just observe how clairon and isnard are looking at me the frequenters of the place gradually came in a waiter lit the gas and several players went and seated themselves at the gaming-table the two girls began to move about the room smiling on the men they knew they ended by seating themselves near the banker who held the cards hoping no doubt to glean a few twenty-franc pieces sauvaire then consented to approach the players marius stayed for a moment standing studying the game he leant over to his companion and said kindly explain to me how i must act the master stevedore was very much amused at the young man's naivety but my good fellow he answered nothing is easier where have you come from every one knows baccarat come here sit down place your stake on this side or that in one of those squares surrounded by a red band you see the banker makes use of two packs of cards of different coloured backs and of fifty-two cards each he deals two cards on each side and two to himself the tens and picture cards do not count the highest point is nine and it is necessary to get as near that as possible if you have no more than the banker you win if less you lose that's all but said marius i see some of the players ask for a card yes answered sauvaire you are allowed to draw a card to arrange your hand you often disarrange it i advise you to always stand at six it's a nice point marius sat down at the table don't you play he inquired of sauvaire faith no answered the master stevedore i prefer having a laugh with clairon and he got up and went hanging round the little brunette the truth was that he was afraid of losing his cash he found gambling ran away with such a lot of money the excitement of winning and losing was too rapid for him he wanted solid lasting enjoyment the banker shuffled the cards make your game gentlemen he said marius placed fifty francs on the cloth with a shudder he had decided that he would play his hundred francs in two stakes red light passed before his eyes he heard a sort of growling within him which made him feel giddy his ears tinkled and his sight was troubled the sensation he experienced was so violent that his heart almost ceased beating nothing more goes said the banker and he dealt the cards it was marius's turn to take them he picked them up and looked at them in a stupid way he had five 
he asked for cards and remained with four the hands were thrown down the banker had three a murmur of astonishment passed round the table marius had won from that moment the young man was beside himself he lived in a sort of dream he remained there for more than five hours downcast overcome sent half asleep by the monotony of the game winning always losing only to win still more he played with an audacity that made the other gamblers tremble and won contrary to every probability clearing out the bankers one after the other beside him was an elderly man who watched him with a stupefied and envious look this person at length bent towards him and asked him in a low tone of voice sir would you be so good as to tell me what your mascot is marius did not hear him a mascot in the slang of provencal gamblers is a sort of talisman which shields the person who possesses it against ill luck all gamblers are more or less superstitious and each of them invents a little protecting divinity as a means of ensuring fortune the old gentleman seemed wounded at marius's silence i don't think i have been indiscreet he continued i should have been curious to know what could possibly have given you such luck i don't hide what i do here's my mascot he took off his hat and displayed an image of the virgin mary inside of it if marius had been calm he would have laughed but he was enervated by several hours play and he made a movement of impatience and continued to pile up the gold before him without uttering a single word sauvert who was astounded at his companion's luck had placed himself behind his chair he preferred to watch the game to playing himself he enjoyed the sight of large sums of money spread out on the gaming-table when he did not run the risk of losing clairon and isnard had followed him and leant familiarly on the back of marius's seat they bent over towards the young man smiled at him fondled him with their eyes the odour of gold had made them hasten forward like birds of prey five o'clock struck the pale daylight was streaming in at the windows the gamblers went off one by one marius ended by finding himself alone he had ten thousand francs in winnings before him the young man would have sat at the gaming-table until evening until the following day without being conscious of it without complaining of the fatigue which was overpowering him for more than five hours he had been playing mechanically having but one idea in his head that of winning of always winning he wanted to finish with it at a single stroke to win the sum he required in one night and not put his feet in the hell again when he found himself alone at the table stupid blind his limbs aching with excitement and weariness he was in despair his eyes sought some one to go on playing with he had just counted the money he had won and he knew it only amounted to ten thousand francs he wanted five thousand francs more he would have given anything in the world for daylight not to have appeared perhaps he might have had time to complete philip's ransom and he was there staring at his gold pieces putting them slowly into his pocket folding up the banknotes one by one looking round the room for a belated gambler there was a man at a small table near him who had been watching the play all the evening without risking anything himself when he had seen marius winning he had approached and had not lost sight of him he seemed to be waiting he let the other gamblers go away one by one fixing his eyes on the young man following the fever that agitated him lying in wait for him as for a sure prey when the latter vexed and shivering was making up his mind to leave the stranger rose hurriedly and approached him sir he inquired will you have a game at ecarte with me marius was about to accept joyfully when sauvert who was following him step by step seized him by the arm and whispered don't play the young man turned round and threw an inquiring look on the master stevedore don't play the latter continued if you wish to keep the ten thousand francs you've got in your pocket for the love of providence refuse and come quickly you will thank me afterwards marius had a good mind not to listen to sauvert but the master stevedore got him little by little near the door and seeing him hesitate he undertook to speak for him no no monsieur felix he said to the man who was offering to play ecarte my friend is tired he can't stay any longer good day monsieur felix monsieur felix seemed very much annoyed at this answer 
he stared fixedly at sauvert as if to say to him what the deuce are you meddling with then he turned on his heels whistled between his teeth and murmured and so i've lost my night sauvert had not let go of marius when they were both in the street the young man inquired of his companion in an irritated tone why did you prevent me playing ah poor innocent answered the master stevedore because i took pity on you because i didn't want felix to win your ten thousand francs from you that man's a rascal then oh no he remains within the strictest limits of honesty then i should have won no you would have lost the calculations of m felix are sure this is how he proceeds he never plays during the night towards morning when the other players are racked with fever he addresses one of them and makes him seat himself at an écarté table it is no longer a question of a game of chance but of a game in which you need all your intelligence and all your calm m felix is calm and prudent he is a head that is fresh and reposed his adversary is feverish blind he does not even see his cards and in a few deals he is stripped in the most straightforward fashion in the world i understand and i thank you m felix has already won quite a fortune by putting his system into practice every evening but i repeat that he plays in a perfectly honourable manner only he arranges things in such a way that his adversaries always play like perfect jackasses and that is how clever people succeed if i were in his place i'd take out a patent marius remained silent the two men had stopped in the middle of the deserted street opposite the entrance to the corneille club it was wet foggy weather nasty odours hovered over the pavement and there was a piercing chill in the matinal breeze buttoned up to their chins both shivering they reeled about like drunkards their pale countenances and sparkless eyes telling the few passers-by what sort of night they had just passed as marius was about to go off he felt an arm slipped in his he turned and recognized isnard clairon had just taken sauvert's arm the two women had not lost sight of these men who smelt of gold they had followed them ravenous at the thought of the ten thousand francs that marius had on him and determined to have their share of the amount the young man appeared to them a simpleton whom they could master without difficulty and strip at their ease isnard burst into a laugh and said in a slightly groggy voice are you going to bed already gentlemen marius rapidly withdrew his arm with an air of repugnance which he did not take the trouble to disguise my loves answered sauvert i am willing to stand you a breakfast eh promise me to be very amusing are you coming marius no answered the young man sharply ah this gentleman is not coming said clairon in a drawling voice ah that's a pity he would have stood us champagne he owes us at least that marius felt in his pockets pulled two handfuls of gold out of them and passed them to clairon and isnard the women pocketed the money without being in the least degree put out until to-night said marius until to-night answered the master stevedore he took one of the women on each arm and went off in that way singing and creating a frightful disturbance in the quiet thoroughfare marius watched him move away and then proceeded to his peaceful little room in the rue sainte it was six o'clock in the morning he went to bed and slept like a top he only awoke at two o'clock when he opened his eyes he perceived the money he had won the reddish reflex running over the gold almost frightened him all at once the night he had passed came back to him with singular distinctiveness and he felt a formidable choking sensation in the throat he was afraid of becoming a gambler for his first thought on awakening was that he would return to the hell in the evening and would win again at this idea a tremor passed through him and he became feverish and enjoyed a moment of voluptuous delight and he repeated to himself no it is not true i cannot be possessed of that horrible passion i cannot have become a gambler from one day to another i gamble to deliver philippe i don't play for myself he did not dare interrogate himself further then he thought of fine and he had to make an effort to restrain his sobs 
he said to himself that he already had ten thousand francs and that he could dispense with returning to the gambling-house assuredly he could easily find five thousand francs he would not run the risk of losing what he had won he dressed himself and went out into the street his head was bursting he did not even think of going to his office he entered a restaurant but could not eat everything he saw seemed to be turning and at times he felt a choking sensation as if he were all at once in want of breath when night came he went as a matter of course step by step to the corneille club End of chapter 14